You may be thinking, well, we just had a spring game. How is this a big week for us? Your team's about to change. In the, in the words of Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic, someone's life's about to change. Several teams, actually, for this year were jam-packed. High atop a brilliantly sunny South Florida. We're in Fort Lauderdale because, um, well, we're homeless right now. We have no studio in Nashville because it's being built. And so we, we have this little compound just to make do until then. The transfer portal's on high alert. We're raising the double red flags on the transfer portal for this week. I am going to, much as I possibly can, tell you what I'm hearing. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I think because, guys, there is a lot of uncertainty on this whole transfer portal front. Uh, you know what? Forget that. I'll save it for the segment. But there's just no one knows. Coaches included. No one really knows. Spring games? Yes, I've got takeaways by the pound tonight. I watched a lot of them on the flight down here yesterday. Watched a few more of them this morning. I have got several takeaways. I've got some head coaches that I think we could define as being at crossroads right now. Not always, though, in the hot seat variety. Like, yeah, there's some guys whose jobs may be on the line this year. But there are other guys who could just either ascend, either continue to be really good or they could ascend to being great, elite, whatever terminology you want to use. So I'm going to talk about that. I am going to announce our next stop on the Pate State Speaker Series a few minutes from now because uh, we got three really good ones this week. We're going to be live from a campus Tuesday night. We're going to be live from a campus Thursday night. And just for good measure, I'm going to stop somewhere on Wednesday as well. So those long-form sit-downs, we took a week's break call it our spring break, but we're right back on the road. They're watching us in Cartersville, Georgia, San Diego, California, Eugene, Oregon, and Lexington, Virginia. Tuned in. Uh, like I said, we're going to be on the road this week, which means a whole lot of good content on especially the Instagram story, at Late Kick Josh. For a variety of reasons, you need to make sure you're following over there. That's the paper stack. Soon to be followed by several paper pops because it's going to be that kind of show tonight. Let us dive in. Let us fan ourselves with our rundown and let us dive in. The transfer portal is on high alert uh, because the portal window is about to open Tuesday. Over on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel, they'll have an entire special for it on Tuesday morning. But in the meantime, here's what's up. I am hearing still that we should expect a ton of movement, uh, some big names. I am stopping short of sharing those big names because, number one, it's normally told to you in confidence. Number two, I don't know if they're going to move. So, so some of them are going to move. I don't know which ones are going to move. I want to remind you of something as we dive into this. So everyone, of course, is focused on who's going to transfer, and you're focused on the big names that are going to be on the move. This is a really, really ugly business now. Once guys started getting treated like professionals on the positive side of things, they started getting treated like professionals on the negative side of things. That means it's not just transfer portal week, guys. It's also cut week. You won't hear that terminology. Uh, it's, it's very, oh, you want to call it underhanded. You want to call it nasty business. Whatever you want to call it, it's real. So not only are you going to have some big name guys garner all the headlines because they're on the move now, you're going to have some guys also uh, subtly but at the same time forcefully inform that you don't really have a spot here anymore. Sorry. We'll help you out as best we can, but bye. And so that's getting ready to happen. Some guys know it's coming. Some guys don't know it's coming. But how uncertain are these next couple of weeks going to be? This thing's open 15 days, starting Tuesday. It's so uncertain that we have entered into a world where coaches text me and ask me what I'm hearing, which is never the world we should live in. But uh, Bradley is my witness. I'm on the softball field the other night. 2-0 start to the season, by the way. Uh, we get done. Keep the cell phone in the book bag for softball games. It requires intense focus to start the season 2-0. Pull out the eye, Josh. Boom, there it is. Major head coaches. You hear anything about my roster? How wild is that? How, it's supposed to be me asking them, not the other way around. But it just goes to show you how uncertain things are. And I've, I've hit up as many informed people as I can about this. And the best intel that I can get is either we think we're good, but we don't know, or... We think we're going to lose so-and-so, but we don't know. And a lot of times what you'll find is you'll be the last to find out. If you're, if you're just a fan waiting at home, yeah, you'll be the last to find out. But what you don't realize is sometimes the head coach of your favorite team will have found out 15 or 20 minutes before you did. Sometimes they're finding out along with you because the guys breaking the news are actually ahead of the head coaches, especially on the side that's losing the player. 
that's just the way it is. So, so it's going to be a very uncertain week. And because of that, I know there are wildly varying opinions on how volatile these next couple of weeks are going to be. But my whole point is, if you got head coaches unsure of the status of their roster, they're the best sources on this thing. Or certainly, if they're not the best, they're way closer than you and I ever will be to the situation. So if they don't fully know, no one can fully know. I have heard way too many people, I've spoken personally to way too many people who expect sort of a couple of big moves early to be the dam breakers in this whole process for it to uh, all be smoke and no fire. So I think we're going to see a lot. Uh, who's out there looking for what? I'm, I'm telling you, a ton of teams are looking for interior defensive line help. Texas needs it. LSU needs it. Auburn needs it. Oklahoma. A lot of teams would love it, but some of them are expected to be like legitimate national championship contenders this year, and they need it. I think Georgia would take one if the right one came along. Bama would take them. I think Bama will probably be in the market for one. Speaking of them, specifically, I've referenced Bama a couple of times over the past couple of months because they're the ones who were in the weird situation back in January. Alabama's the team that had their head coach change in January, so then their roster is open for 30 days and any of them can leave, but Bama can't go take any kids and they just have to sit there and watch and it frankly wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. But you do lose like that kid right there, the Caleb Downs is, is, is of the world. You, you watch him walk out the door and you can't go back, Phil, until now. Bama can go back, Phil, now. So, so teams like Alabama, they get to go hunting now. The difference is Bama can't take any SEC kids because the SEC has a self-imposed rule that I need to remind you guys of. You can't, you can't have SEC on SEC crime here in the second portal window because the SEC says so. Now, that does sound like good news, like some of you out there clap and then you realize, oh wait, that just means they're gonna come after our players. And yes, you are correct about that. A bunch of teams in the South have a bunch of money to spend. They're about to free up some more of it, call it clearing up cap space if you want to, and they're going to have needs and they can't, they can't take from each other. So guess who that leaves? Yeah, that leaves you. Miami's gonna be a huge mover here. There is, there is no way around that. Miami's gonna be a really, really big mover. I would say half a dozen or more impact players. They will target. I think they feel good about several of them and, and frankly have for a few weeks. So I don't know who the big winner is gonna be. Like we'll have that segment a couple of weeks from now. I'd be very surprised if we weren't talking about the Miami Hurricanes as having fundamentally altered their starting 22, or at the very least, the depth at a couple of key positions uh, relative to what they are right now as they just wrapped up spring play. Oklahoma, they're going to get any offensive line help? Very curious there. Talked the other night about how the NIL situation at Oklahoma has been a little unique because they've made moves on the defensive side, but the offensive side, specifically O-line, it's kind of still wait and see. I don't think there's any Oklahoma fan that has read practice reports, uh, looked at clips of practice. You'll watch your spring game. I don't think any Oklahoma fans are looking and saying, whew, all right, well, there go my concerns about the offensive line. We're good there. No, you're not. Not if you want to play at the level you think Oklahoma football should be playing. Remember the new staffs. Now, Oklahoma doesn't have a new staff, but like Mississippi State, Jeff Levy comes in there. They got a brand new staff. They've had spring to evaluate the roster. Now they get to go out there and try and make some noise. The other MSU, Michigan State, Jonathan Smith, commented a couple of weeks ago on them about how I thought they walked in the door and, and maybe the, the whole process of building that NIL structure was a little overwhelming. Still a work in progress there, but they're probably going to be active here. How active remains to be seen. Washington, brand new staff up there. Lost 21 of 22 starters from last team. Uh, Jed Fish didn't get his biggest playmakers to follow him when he went there from Arizona. Washington could be a player here. Colorado with Deion Sanders, it would be foolish to rule them out. And I'll also tell you another one, and they've already been active, but could still be more active, and that's Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss. If we want to look at them, and I do, as a window team and a window program, meaning they're not going to consistently look like they do right now every year, well, that's just all the more incentive to go all in on this year. And it, 
it would surprise me if they weren't active, actually, these next couple of weeks. But just remember now, with Ole Miss, with any of those teams down south, that SEC rule, you cannot be looking at Alabama going and taking kids from Florida. You will not see Ole Miss taking kids from LSU or vice versa. What you could see is Ole Miss taking kids from Utah, and I just made up randomly those two, so don't read anything into that. But it's a mm, – I, I, I don't – cover the portal exclusively, but we talk about it a lot on the show. I, I just cannot tell you in strong enough terms how nervous a lot of staffs are right now. And it's so different than the way it used to be. It used to be you wrap up camp, spring, and then you can start to really dive in, if, especially if you got like a new coordinator on campus or whatnot. You can dive into the nuts and bolts of install and you can, go, you can go on the road and you can visit with some staffs if you want to. you got the camp circuit coming up in June, and that's a, a grinder in its own right. And July is now one of, if not the biggest recruiting months of the year, wrapping it up in July. But man, now you've got that second portal window, and you don't have any recourse. If you get victimized, you don't have any recourse. I mean, c- consider the prospect of having dedicated 90% of your reps at tight end to a couple of guys, and then both of them just leave because they get bought by big-time SEC or Big Ten schools. What do you do? Like, those were highly functional parts of your scheme and your entire offense, and now they're just gone, and you got a freshman there with uh, 14 career snaps under his belt. Your team just got fundamentally altered. You have no recourse. There's nothing you can do. There is no summer portal window. So everybody's worried about that. And uh, that's, that's just the reality of college football now. So I know I have some people watching. I know I'll have some people in the comment section. I actually had one the other day. said, it's about time these multimillionaires had something to worry about. Sir, sir, the wide receivers coach at Miami of Ohio may be many things, but a multimillionaire is not one of them. So we are not talking about the tippy-tippy top of the pyramid exclusively here. We're talking about the base of it. And the base of it is full of a lot of folks who may be doing a really really good job of eval and development and may have worked their roster up two or three years to where they've got guys ready to contribute only to watch a random ACC program with needs and money come and grab them at the 11th hour if you can get the if you can get the credits to transfer which in and of itself is a really really interesting conversation I was at a place recently where there were basketball transfers happening and you, you may think to yourself, oh, once you've got several years under your belt, well, then it gets easier to transfer. No, it gets harder to transfer because you got a, you got a place out there and a kid's been playing three or four years there. And then all of a sudden they want to transfer to Pate State. Well, I've got to take his credits. And look, we're prestigious. We care about the classroom at Pate State. I'm not just going to slap that sticker on your degree and hand it to you when 95% of your course load has come from... Who in the world knows? Like Brandon Walker Community College. Absolutely not. So sometimes it's harder to get that transfer approved, not because you're not athletically skilled enough, but because uh, you, may have, you may have sketch athlete worked your way to where you are academically. Nonetheless, uh, I do have to say this before we move on. The transfer portal, no one's immune to portal rumors. I'm not immune to portal rumors. As you know, this time of year, I'm on the road a lot, which means we drive a lot. I got about a six hour drive ahead of me tomorrow to go to a place that I'm about to reveal momentarily. So Bucky's is a big, big deal in the South. Bucky's is not a gas station. It's, it's more an experience. And no one who's been to Bucky's has ever called Bucky's overrated. It's just the folks who have driven by it and Frankly, some of you are intimidated by 120 gas pumps. You can see those places from space. The one in Athens, Alabama and Calhoun, Georgia, I frequent constantly. Here's the problem. I don't have a personal relationship with Bucky's outside of my fascination and brand loyalty. I've done a lot for Bucky's. Bucky's has never done for me. As you also know, I've been in a bit of a social media war with Quick Trip. I didn't instigate it, but I'm certainly not going to sit there and just take shot after shot from whichever 22-year-old intern is running these social accounts for Quick Trip. Well, here's the thing about Quick Trip. They know, they know that deep down, every man can be bought. Meemaw said it first, Quick Trip must have heard her, because the other day, Quick Trip came to me on, on the socials, mind you. I made a comment about the transfer portal. And Quick Trip looked at it and said, there's our shot. And they said, has Bucky's ever officially invited you anywhere? 
This is my open invitation for Pate State to visit anytime. And I'm at a crossroads. On one hand, I've been very loyal to Bucky's. On the other hand, I've got an offer from Quick Trip. So while everyone else is worried about their offensive tackle situation and whether they have enough interior defensive line depth this week, I'm going to be on the road. A great deal. I'm going to have to fill my tank up several times. I'm going to have to fill my tummy up several times. Let's just be real. I'm a person with needs as well, nutritionally. And I'm not so sure that maybe Bucky's is the answer for me anymore. Maybe, just maybe, after I talk it over with my family, maybe Quick Trip is the place that feels most like home to me. I don't know, guys. I'm very conflicted about it. But anyway, Transfer Portal, going to be crazy this week. My personal life, my travels will be crazy this week. At Late Kick Josh, I, I guarantee you traction on both of those fronts this week. Speaking of which, I have a um, breaking news post-it right there on the index finger. I'm ready to commit somewhere else. I'm ready to straighten my love, Mike. And I'm ready to commit somewhere else. So, here we go. Pate State Speaker Series, back on the road this week. I think this one's going to be one of the most interesting that we've done. We will be Tuesday, live from the University of Florida. Billy Napier will be on this show, live. Extended sit-down with him the day the portal opens. A lot of you have a lot to say. A lot of you have a lot of thoughts about the state of Florida's program. Florida Gator fans themselves are conflicted on the state of the program, where are we headed, year three under Billy Napier. Well, I'll just ask him myself, and you'll benefit from it, because I guarantee you that'll be an eye-opener, and uh, Billy Napier, knowing him like I think I do, will be pretty blunt and straightforward about where things are. He's not going to sit here and tell you his program's perfect, but he's going to give you a little bit deeper insight than your local message board will, and um, you know we'll hold him to it. So we're going to have a really, really fun show Tuesday live from Florida. That will be the first of three stops that we make this week. We've never done the show live from Florida, and that changes about 48 hours from now. Really looking forward to that. Okay, I watched, let's be real, basically every spring game that happened yesterday I watched. That's a lie. I watched as many as I could. Um, we, we were headed down here yesterday, and I know that you've been following the news, and Boeing has not been shining in the best of lights lately, especially the 737 MAX 8s of which I was on one yesterday. So we're on the tarmac, and we are at BNA, Nashville, for the unwashed. And we're, we're taxiing out there, and then all of a sudden, our plane does the equivalent of pulling over to the side of the road. And we were informed that there's a slight issue. Not a significant one, just a slight issue. That means you only slightly crash if it goes wrong. And so we got pulled over. So that gave me, my point here in this story is that gave me some more time to start looking over spring games. And so I did. I got a lot to say about them. The Georgia spring game yesterday, Colby Young, man. What, what, what were we talking about? Last time, last two times we talked about Georgia on this show this spring, I said, they've got a kid from Miami that some of you may know, some of you may not, but man, Colby Young's good. And he's a different, like, big-bodied receiver. Well, there he is in the spring game yesterday. One of the first things I saw, because I happened to scrub ahead in their game, boom, Colby Young boxing someone out in the end zone, making a touchdown catch. But beyond him, so, so first off, Colby Young's going to be a serious factor for Georgia this year. And I didn't need the spring game to tell me that, but the spring game reinforced it. So anecdotally, I'm going to point it out. Uh, you know Georgia had 18 guys, I think, catch balls in the spring game yesterday. And also, if you've listened to Kirby talk, he said it on our show when we had him on a couple of months ago, kind of, but then he really hammered it home after the G-Day game. He said, typically, the, the characteristics and the traits that he wants out of his DBs, his wide receiver room is actually exhibiting right now. Like the offensive line unit there in the wide receiver room, kind of the two alpha positions on Georgia's roster. And they had 18 guys catch balls yesterday, and certainly that's not going to be how many guys figure into the regular rotation this fall. But it goes to show you how deep and versatile the room is there. I don't think there's a guy on that roster that's going to go out there and, and drop like a Devontae Smith type year on you. But what they do have is they've got like half a dozen guys who any week could drop seven catches for 120 and two touchdowns on you. And that's not typically what we've said about Georgia. So that was good to see. Uh, DB, I think, is still sort of in a state of flux with them. Now, here's the difference. Okay, what Georgia has right now at defensive back 
If they had it elsewhere to an 80 percentile degree in college football, they'd be happy with it. But Kirby's not settling for that. And I think I took note of one thing that as, as, as I followed Georgia throughout the spring and he hammered it home yesterday afterwards, I've been on the road a lot this spring and I've had some coaches off the record admit that, yeah, a lot of these guys who are out this spring injured are not injured. They're just not playing because their uncle or their agent or whoever told them not to. And what can I do? If I push him on it really hard, I'm going to lose him in the portal. Whether you like it or not, that's going on. Probably at your school right now. Well, Kirby said, yeah, we've actually got guys fighting to make sure they play in the spring game and getting pissed off at us because we're trying to keep them out to preserve them for the fall. That's, you want to know what a championship culture looks like. That's one. That's one. How terrified are your guys? First off, how competitive are your guys to just want to play because they threw a football out on the field? The other thing is, how terrified are they that three or four former top 100 recruits are right behind them on the depth chart? That's why you got to be relentless recruiting. Stack as many of them as you can. That's one reason. And the other reason is because you all of a sudden find out you don't really have to worry about guys sort of napping through spring ball. Because if they do then uh, they can take a nap in the fall as well because they won't be playing, they won't be starting. Uh, They look good at running back, man. Georgia looks really good at running back. And I think tight end was not featured in this game much yesterday, but I think tight end's a position of strength for them as well. So they're going to be, as usual, able to be very balanced and very versatile offensively. Here's the thing. So I know that people will watch Georgia. If you could go to practice there, your jaw would be on the ground. You would look around and you would say, how in the world is anyone going to beat this team? You could watch them in the spring game. You don't even have to be at practice. You could watch them in the spring game. You could just look at the raw athleticism out there and think to yourself, man, how's anyone going to beat this team this fall? And it's like the best way I can describe why guys like Kirby Smart are so paranoid, even though they may have the best talent roster in the country, is it's not the average temperature, okay? So like in the United States of America right now, the average temperature could be 65 degrees. It's perfectly comfortable. But you know there are cold pockets somewhere where it may be 37. That's football. You just got to find your cold pockets. You got to make sure you minimize your cold pockets. So while you may be looking at Carson Beck, you may be looking at that ground game, you may be looking even without Brock Bowers at the potential of the tight end room or the wide receiver room, Kirby Smart knows there are cold pockets on this team. And it's not even a fully formed team yet because it's still spring. But that, in a nutshell, is why guys like that, no matter how good they look, will never be content. They can't be. That's the nature of what got them where they are in the first place. The reason I'm talking about that is because I had someone text me and say, Did you hear Kirby? Did you hear him gaslighting, in their words, after the spring game, trying to pretend like they've got so many issues? Well, to their standard, they do. To their standard, their defensive back room's not good enough. I, have you not listened to that guy, by the way? He doesn't really BS you a lot. He may not give you everything, but he doesn't BS you a lot. In, in press conferences, we had him on the show. It, it's pretty much what you see is what you get. He'll be honest with you if you ask him the right questions. So Georgia, probably going to start the season as number one. They're not without questions. Uh, they'll be the favorite to win the national title, as they probably should. But... Where are the cold pockets? That, that's, all, that's all guys like Kirby Smart are focused on right now. There was a cold pocket on the show there for a couple of weeks, wasn't there? Because there was no Academy Sports and Outdoors. Um, just, a little, just a little oversight. Just a little behind-the-scenes shenanigans on our part. Translation, we were negotiating a new deal with them. But it's finalized now. So Academy is back. And just as soon as Academy is back, I look in our mentions. And uh, I, apparently a lot of you had been boycotting amongst yourselves. It wasn't organized, nor do I ever encourage you to organize boycotts against our partners when they're no longer partners, uh, because we will never be without Academy. Let's be real. Academy lives here. Even if they're not on a lower third or in a monitor in the background, Academy's here. I think even on podcasts, you can tell I'm tapping my chest right now. One-stop shop for all things outdoor, sporting goods, and beyond. I had a text, and this is just between you and I, so keep this, keep this quiet for now. But I had a text yesterday as I was parked on the tarmac uh, from a very, very high-level mustache at Academy. And they just had some questions about how we handle the the shipment and the manufacturing 
of Chalai of Supremacy. Wasn't that a paper popper of a question? Imagine, just imagine. Not, not John Lennon style either. Imagine what it could be like one day. Anyway, uh, academy.com if you can't get there in person, but Academy Sports and Outdoors, a proud, proud partner, and we are proud to partner with them of Late Kick. Uh, we continue. Got a lot of spring games to talk about. I've also, at the very, very bottom of my stack here, I've got to talk to you about some of these coaches at Crossroads. Oof. Yes, but it's not always bad. It's just like varying degrees. You know, some people accuse us around here of sunshine pumping in the spring. So I'm taking it upon myself to mix in a little, a little well-sought-out negativity on each show. Just like Mima always dreamed I would. Uh, let's continue. The Alabama spring game was on ESPN. I assume a lot of you saw it yesterday. I, there's, there's no need to really make more of this quarterback situation than there is. Jalen Milrow is the overwhelming favorite to be their starter right now, yet it's not decided. So uh, that means Ty Simpson had his moments yesterday. Anytime you've got a new staff and a new offense in there, I just don't assume anything. Uh, Milrow, I would pencil in as their starter right now, but I don't assume anything. I still won't. I have no clue what could happen between now and fall. If I had $10 in my pocket, I'd overwhelmingly bet it on Milrow. The other thing is, there's virtually no chance all four of those guys, plus Cade Carruth, but, but to a, a more serious degree, all, all four of those guys are going to remain on this roster. If they do, hats off to them. But it's very, very impractical these days to see four quality guys on a roster at the quarterback position. Uh, it's, it's the dream of every staff. Most of them admit they just want two good ones. The big boys want three or four if they can get them. But, man, that's 2015 logic. 2024, you're just hoping to hold on to two of them. So, Milrow, Ty Simpson, I mean, Dylan Lonergan is a, can be a very good football player. Austin Mack's not going anywhere because he just transferred in there. But uh, they got an underrated good quarterback room there. It's just th th there's no, like, Caleb Williams-esque star Jalen Milrow is the closest thing to that. Ty Simpson was very, very heralded out of high school. We'll see. We'll see. In other words, I don't think anything yesterday uh, forwarded or reversed my opinion on that. The grass sucked. I don't know what in the world the excuse was there, but the grass did not meet standard. Jeremy Bernard at wide receiver did, and whether he was catching balls across the sodded middle or or on the decrepit corners of the field, Jeremy Bernard looked good. He was a big addition. He was at Washington last year, and they were, they were really excited to get him. When we were at Bama the other day, talking to pretty much any coach, they talked about how good he is. He's got his big opportunity this year, but also how, how important it was to have him in that wide receiver room because it allows sort of a domino effect of other guys to fall in their proper positions. You know who could blow up in this offense at Alabama is Kendrick Law. Kendrick Law is a guy who was recruited there. I think he was a four-star guy, and he just kind of blends into the Bama scene, and you're used to them having a lot of good players, and he's there. But then you have this big change. A new staff comes in, a new way of doing things, a new offense. And if you watch them yesterday, certainly it's not a, an apples-to-apples -apples shot at how Nick Sheridan and Kalen DeBoer are going to call games in the fall, but they got the ball out really quick. And really twitchy, fast players benefit from that a lot. And Law is all of those things. And I think that this could be the year more so than any other guy in that receiver room that he takes a big leap. I don't know what to make of that defense. They looked very soft up the middle yesterday. But I'm sure, you know, if we had Kane Womack on the show, he would say, turn the cameras and mics off for a second. And then he'd say, yeah, we didn't do anything. We didn't call anything. Plus, we're still on the install portion of a lot of what we do, and he'd be right about all of it. Of course he would be. He's calling the defense. So I'm going to reserve judgment, but I'm just going to tell you um, the ability to stand up on third and short in the SEC, the ability to stand up inside the 10-yard line, inside the 5-yard line, normally decides two or three games. And so, you know, if, if yesterday was just a mirage, that's okay. I'm not so sure it was. And so there may be a little ways to go there. And they may be looking for interior defensive line help as well. Run game's really good. Alabama can absolutely run the ball to win this year. Justice Haynes is good. Jan Miller's back. He's good. Richard Young, really good. As Chip Kelly would call that, a pair and a spare. And I'm not really sure which one the spare is. I am, however, quite certain that other staffs out there, knowing what Tuesday is, were probably watching that game yesterday saying, who's running with the threes? He could be our one. 
go offer him. So a couple of beads of sweat coming down the old Alabama forehead over the next 48 hours on that front. Uh, let's see. Let's just go to Columbus, not Georgia, Ohio. Columbus State did not have their spring game yesterday because Columbus State just has a club football team. But Ohio State does not. Colin, here's your end point. The Ohio State spring game yesterday had to start with quarterbacks. Will Howard uh, looked good. Um, remember, this is Chip Kelly's offense now. And remember, you had the transfer of Julian Sayan in there. And I was lurking on Bucknuts the other day pre-spring game, and there was a lot of talk about whether Julian Sayan, who was, if you're not familiar, the five-star true freshman who enrolled at Bama, then transferred out of Bama, and so he, he was already two schools deep before spring ball began, and he's at Ohio State. A lot of people were wondering, could he make a move? Because he's really talented. He, he's not going to impress you physically right now when he walks in a room. You know, he's not 6'6", 230 or anything like that. But when the ball gets snapped, it doesn't take too long for you to look and say, who's that kid? It's Julian Sayan. He's really good. Now he's a true freshman. And I ultimately think experience, while it always matters, will matter a metric ton this year. Because elsewhere, Ohio State pretty much knows what they have. They know they can win games defensively. They need a good decision maker who is good enough athletically. And that's Will Howard, and he can run as well, a lot of what you didn't see yesterday because it's a spring game. But I'll keep an eye on it. I just, I still am of the opinion that I would make Howard the overwhelming favorite to be the starter there. The rest of this offense, outside the offensive line, is ready-made right now. you got maybe the best one-two at running back in the country, or if not, one of the best. Like I said, you got probably a couple of options by the time the season rolls around that could play winning football for you at quarterback. I wonder about the offensive line. I look at it, and I think they could add another piece or two. They could absolutely stand to. I wonder if the coaching staff feels the same way. I also wonder if the pieces will be available. Here's the thing. If they have trouble, if that offensive line is not what we want it to be at the beginning of the year, Ohio State, for the first time in a long time, can look at you and say, yeah, we're comfortable playing first to 20. We are comfortable playing first team to 20 wins. Only Iowa talks like that in the Big Ten, and that's mainly because they can't score 20. Ohio State's in a situation right now where they've probably got the best defense in the Big Ten to start the year. And if they don't, they won't be far off from it. And so, like, Jim Knowles was talking yesterday. I was listening to some of his post-game press conference, and um, it's just crazy how much difference one guy can make. At coordinator, how much difference one guy can make in this sport? You want to know why coaches get paid so much money? It's because man-to-man, -man, that's the kind of impact you can have. Like, they go and hire Knowles, keep recruiting the same kind of guys, keep developing like they didn't change strength and conditioning, nothing like that changed, and they go from being in the 90s in pass D to being top three in pass D. It's Jim Knowles. Like, he's got a good staff around him, but that's what changed, and that's wild. So... The defensive tackle depth, unlike some places, is phenomenal at Ohio State. Their only task is keeping all those guys. You look elsewhere, LSU's like crawling through the desert, about to starve to death if they don't dehydrate themselves first, looking anywhere for an oasis or a defensive tackle. And Ohio State's like, yeah, we got like five or six. We're good. Yeah, we're, we're fine. We can, we can stop the run with them. We can get after the quarterback with them. They're really good there. Secondary, unbelievable. And that's before the additions they made, but with the additions especially, unbelievable. Wide receiver is interesting. So Igbuka is a known commodity. Outside of that, I guarantee if I had Ohio State fans at the desk, they would 100% sell me on the potential of all these guys. And they should because they do. Like, like Jeremiah Smith, as a true freshman, has the raw physical tools to be one of the best receivers in the country. He's got the raw physical tools to be the best on that team. But he's unproven, as are most true freshmen in spring. I get that. But there's a lot of potential on that team in the wide receiver room that thus far is unproven. And I think that's, that's what the focus for that coaching staff is, is we think that room should be a strength, and sometimes it can be hard to tell going up against that defense in practice, is it going to be a strength? It should be. Is it going to be a strength? 
That's kind of what I left Ohio State spring game thinking. That could be the best team in the country. Uh, they could win a national championship, even though I know some of you think that's impossible because Ryan Day can't win a national championship. But uh, you know what Meemaw would say about that, so I don't need to remind you the can't versus hasn't quote from Meemaw. Next up, ton to go still. They're watching us, by the way. I appreciate you guys. Got a lot watching live. Uh, subscribe to the channel. It's just not some once a week thing now. I know that there are a lot of distractions out there, but here in this household, we just do college football year round. Not necessarily of the hot take variety. We just do college football the way you would with your cousin Elroy if you guys were sitting out on the patio at sunset in uh, Utah, Alabama, spelled with an E, by the way, because that's the way that we vibe around here. So if you like it and you want to keep the show free, subscribe to the channel and like the video. They're watching us in Prairie Grove, Arkansas. They're watching us in Destin, Florida and Long Island, New York. Sizable population in the New York metro area for us. Let's continue. All right. Miami played a spring game yesterday. Cam Ward looked really good. Not a surprise to anyone on this program and shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because Cam Ward was a very, very hot commodity in the transfer portal market, flirted with the NFL, and he said, no, I think I'm, think I'm actually going to take my talents to South Beach. He's certainly not the first high-profile athlete to do it, won't be the last. He was 19 of 24, 324 yards, three touchdowns. As I told you guys the other day, I went down there a couple of weeks ago. I know the locker combination to the door, and so I snuck in and I go to practice. That's not really how it happened, but I watched practice. I'm talking about after they slam the doors and kick everyone else out, I watched practice. Cam Ward looks incredible. Now, I saw him one day. You saw him yesterday in the spring game. Looks really good. I don't want to overhype him because you're literally watching a spring practice and a spring game. I'm not going to. I'm just saying it's going to be the best quarterback situation they've had there in several years. I have no doubt about that. Now, the portal window is about to open, and I guarantee you what that coaching staff is down at Miami thinking is, I, that sounds bad, so if I want to clip this later, I want to say it right. Cam Ward, Cam Ward's everything they hoped he would be and then some. So if you're the Miami coaching staff, you look and you say, all right, so we killed it on this guy. Like, we, we got it. We nailed it. He's everything we hoped he would be. We may not have guys like that just come along every year we got to make the most of this. We, we've got a window, at least one year, with an elite quarterback. Let's go all in. And they're going to. So they're going to be very aggressive in the portal. Restrepo, by the way, who's already there and has been there for a few years, Xavier Restrepo could be a breakout player this year, and he's been around forever. Normally it's the true freshman or maybe second-year players that you say that about, but Restrepo was already a 1,000-yard guy last year. So he's already really good, but he has not played with a talent like this. And especially if Miami deepens that wide receiver room and takes some of the pressure off him, like Xavier Restrepo could go off this year and you could look at him and say, I, I wasn't familiar with your game. Well, maybe you just didn't see him having a guy the caliber of Cam Ward throwing him the ball. And you will this year. So it's a unique opportunity for him. The caliber of athlete overall is what stands out to me. Now they held a lot of guys out yesterday and they've held a lot of guys out for portions of spring, like Reuben Bain, for example. They know what they have with him. So you could kind of, kind of list him as being on a pitch count. They held a few guys out, but overall, I feel very confident in saying the caliber of athlete Miami's going to take the field with is light years different than the one from the team Mario inherited a couple of years ago. So that doesn't mean anything other than they'll be bigger and faster and stronger. Then it's up to you to go win games with them. It's the beauty of it. You can come in and you take over whatever you take over and then you get to remodel it and remake it your way. And I remember when he took the job, he told me that 2024 year, that's, that's where we really feel like we can start to put the gas all the way down to the floor. Here we go. I don't think they've backed off that either. So here we go. Uh, the most enigmatic team though to talk about right now at the higher levels to me is Miami because of how aggressive I think they're going to be in the portal. Therefore, how incomplete this year's starting lineup probably is right now. I don't know who the names are going to be. Got some guesses, but I don't know who the names are going to be. But there will be starters, for all intents and purposes, on that team, maybe by the end of this coming week, that aren't on it right now. So how do you print your preview magazine? 
How, how do you generate your preseason J people? You can't. That's why it's going to be a wild week, and it's, it's a really enigmatic team because you can't, you can't talk about a team that doesn't exist, and they don't exist right now in full form. They don't exist. You can say that about everyone, but really say it about Miami. Let's move on. I have a very nondescript bottle because this company hasn't paid for me to describe them, but I'm going to take a sip from it. Just normal water. And we, um, we got to talk about a team that I was accused of not talking about enough the other day, which is surprising because this is the team that brought us to the dance. This is the team in 2019 when we were toiling away down in Columbus, Georgia, that started to go on a national championship run, and, and we picked them in the summer, and the rest is history. LSU, spring game yesterday. Defense is still a concern here. I don't want to beat around the bush. Their defense was bad last year. Scratch that. Defense was terrible last year. And they gutted the staff, and, and a lot of the same players are there. They went and got the defensive coordinator, defensive line coach from Missouri, went and got Bo Davis from Texas. Just A++++ for the staff overhaul that Brian Kelly and company did. However, the roster is still a giant question mark. And therefore, the portal and what they're about to do, and it's a giant question mark. And here's the thing. So they, they talked yesterday about how they really ran a vanilla scheme defensively. Well, yeah, that's, that's okay. You're not the first, nor are you the last to do that. But you still had guys looking confused, and you claim to me you're not even running anything. So that, to me, is not a, is not a good sign. And you had a lot of former four- and five-star talent out there that do not play at that level. And that has nothing to do with the new staff. The new staff inherits whatever they inherit. And I'm talking about the defensive staff. But, man, uh, elsewhere, you know, Nussmeyer, 7-for-7, seven 187 yards, two touchdowns. He'll, he'll be plenty good enough. I actually believed in Nussmeyer two years ago. I thought they could have played him then. Uh, but point taken why they didn't. Wide receiver core, going to be deep and talented. They'll have the offensive line and ground game, or should, to run the ball and kill clock if necessary, like the other components of this offense look good. In other words, what I'm trying to ask is, I'm not about to sit here and watch another year where LSU wastes a good offense with just inferior productivity defensively, am I? Now, unlike last year where we were saying that week three, week four, week five, and you can't do anything about it, it's still spring. The portal hasn't even opened yet. So LSU can do something about it. Now, they need defensive tackle help bad. I am going to tell you they need secondary help pretty bad. Like guys that can start, they can afford to make moves. We'll see if they do. Gabe Relliford popped off the screen. I don't know if he's going to play much this year. He's a true freshman defensive end. But, man, if you watched LSU spring game, or if you didn't and you go back and watch it later, check out Gabe Relliford. That's, that's what LSU defensive players are supposed to look like. They're supposed to look like they were just born that way. And then all of a sudden they show up on campus, and then you start to develop them from there. But this is a team that could be – top 10. It could also be out of the top 25 by season's end, and it's all going to come down to the same thing it came down to last year, and that is, can you, if not play dominant defense, that's probably a pipe dream. If you can't do that, can you, can you be takeaway centric? Can you be opportunistic? Can you shine in the red zone? Can you do certain things well enough to where if, if Garrett Nussmeyer and that offense carry the weight, I mean, like last year, had a top 30 defense, you probably would have played for a national championship. Can you give me something better than that? Fingers crossed. We will be, if you're tuning in late, we will be in Gainesville, Florida all day Tuesday. And we will do a show live from Florida Tuesday night. We'll have Billy Napier on the show. I'm looking really forward to that. But in the meantime, I watched Florida spring game yesterday. What an interesting quarterback dynamic, huh? So you got Graham Mertz. One of the better quarterbacks in the country last year that no one talked about because his team was not good. And, uh, and then you got a new guy. You got DJ Lagway in there, a true freshman, the crown jewel of the recruiting class last year. And he went 12 for 21. And when you have a true freshman in a spring game, you're not looking for the stat line. You're looking for the moments. And he had a couple of moments, 6'3", 241, uh, moves like someone who weighs half of that. And uh, I just – I – Go back to the age-old Mimaism, where she always told me, Joshua, do not be giving up on teams early who have good quarterback rooms. That doesn't guarantee anything, Mimaw. And she's right, though. You got good quarterback play, you got a shot. And 
you know, there's a stat that I'm going to focus on a little bit more in summer, especially as it relates to Florida and Missouri, because I don't want to, I don't want to tire you out on it right now, but there's a stat that I pay a lot of attention to that they may benefit from. Who knows? But Trevor Etienne, remember the running back, he transferred to Georgia, good player, um, and he's going to be a good player for Georgia this year. I think the, the casual fan saw him transfer from Florida and said, that's it. That's it. Start etching the tombstone. And Florida folks are like, hey, look, we may suck this year for all we know. Maybe we go 10 and 2, maybe we go 2 and 10, but we're going to be okay at running back. And the rest of the country are like, oh, oh, you just lost one of your best players. And they're like, yeah, we did. We have like four more. And they're right. Let me give you an example. Yesterday in the spring game, Montreal Johnson and uh, Trayvon Webb are probably their 1 2 at running back. They combine for 28 yards. They're good. Like, I don't need to see anything from them. But Jackson had five carries for 60 yards. Ball had 12 carries for 77 yards. They're like three or four deep in that room with guys who can play winning football in the SEC. So, look, I'm not guaranteeing you Florida wins eight or nine games, but they'll be fine at running back this year. Special teams, however, it was a disaster again yesterday. For a spring game, it was a disaster. By disaster, I don't mean they missed all their kicks or anything like that. I mean communication is still not what it needs to be. I am watching from 50,000 feet. I am not going to pretend to tell you I know the why behind the chronic communication issues that have plagued Florida special teams over the past couple of years. I don't have to know the why, just like I don't need to be a doctor to know an ugly baby when I see it. Florida special teams has been an ugly baby a few too many times, and it's inexcusable. And unlike, again, unlike last year, when it was ongoing during the season, this is spring. You could still fix this. You can see, in fact, maybe, maybe when we take our trip to Gainesville Tuesday, we just go and we sit down with the appropriate parties and we map out a plan. Maybe that's what it takes. Maybe, maybe I'll sketch some things out on a pizza box, but for real, it doesn't matter what the reasons are. It's just got to get fixed. They can't be losing games for those reasons. This, this far into a coaching regime, that can't be tolerated. And that's not a Napier team. You go back and look at other stops in his career. Look at him at Louisiana. They were a ratcheted up, really, really high functioning program. They didn't have those issues. At least I don't remember them having those issues. Also, portal, got to be a focus. Got to be, a, we, we will be in the building all day Tuesday as the portal opens. So cell phones off, but we'll be on the building. Wide receiver, could see him make a move there. Tight end, defensive line, uh, maybe interior offensive line, who knows, but Florida's got to be really active as well. You know, I, FanDuel is the exclusive odds provider of our show, and I really appreciate it. And they always, they always are very inquisitive about what I think some, some good ideas could be, both for the show and then just like in general. What is the public interested in that it would make sense for us to offer? Now, this is a very sick, very twisted, very sadistic idea. But if we ever get to the point, coaches, close your ears, parents, close your ears. If we ever get to the point where our buddies at FanDuel start offering prop bets about the transfer portal, over, under, how many guys a team is going to take over the next 15 days, dare I say yes or no, is wide receiver two off of team X going to be with that team or not? Now that would be a sick, sick world. Of course, I'm not here lo lobbying for it. Far be it for me to do that. I'm just throwing around ideas. So that's what the calls sound like between FanDuel and I when they happen, and Nick, of course, who runs sales for me. So FanDuel, does offer you a lot of future odds that are ethical and are well within the realm of believability. For example, do you think Penn State could win the Big Ten this year? I don't. It's rhetorical. I don't need answers from you guys or the control room. I didn't need that. Uh, but if you do think they can, you can go bet it right now. If you think they're going to miss the playoff, you know you can go bet that. I revealed that on the show a couple of weeks ago, but I know some of you have been living your lives. FanDuel actually has make or miss bets on playoff teams right now. Ohio State to make the playoff, to miss the playoff. Now you're going to have to lay some juice if you think Ohio State's going to miss the playoff. But I had some guy come at me today on Twitter and say they're not going to finish top two in the conference. And I'm like, give me some of that action, immunity. So FanDuel, 
and you want to bet it right now, or you're just curious, you want to look around, check them out. They are the exclusive odds provider of Pate State. The only college right now to have an exclusive odds provider on the cutting edge, as usual. All right, uh, do we have that Twitter question, Colin? We had, a, we had a question earlier today. I did want to get to this. Good crowd here. Appreciate you guys being tuned in. I, I always ask the folks at the Masters, can you make sure you wrap the tournament up before we go on air? And every year they agree to something about cordiality and sunshine, not in that order. But I digress. Here we are. We are, we are unopposed to the Masters this year. Donald from Annapolis, Maryland hit me and said, hey, which coaches do you believe are at a crossroads this season? Now, Donald, I think maybe you meant which guys are on the hot seat. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I didn't take it that way. I think you could be at a crossroads and be totally safe. Now, some of these guys may be on a hot seat, but some of them could be safe and just they're at an inflection point in their career. So I think, I think Billy Napier, it's fair to describe him as being at a crossroads. My opinion on Billy Napier, who we'll have on the show Tuesday, is Billy Napier is a phenomenal football coach who, who was really good at Louisiana and who got hired at Florida. And I think of him the same way I would a really, really potentially high-performing automobile that pulled out of the driveway and got its wheels stuck in a, like a muddy ditch. Nothing wrong with the car, but the wheels spinning. And, you know, if you're late for work or whatever, it's not a big deal. But if you don't put together a good season your first three years in the SEC, you could be out of a job. And it's not like Frank Beamer at Virginia Tech where they gave him a ton of runway and he's got like six years before he wins more than six games. That doesn't happen. And so you could be a really good coach. And if you don't pretty immediately figure things out, you could be out of a job. And that's why this year is a crossroads year for Billy Napier because I am not like a lot of other people. I'm not of the opinion that he's in over his head or anything like that. I, I'm not of that opinion. I am of the opinion that there are some things about being the head coach at Florida that are a little bit different than being the head coach at Louisiana. And sometimes that stuff's hard to digest at the outset. Not everyone just seamlessly transitions. Doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're incapable. It just means it didn't immediately click. So yeah, absolutely a crossroads year there. I think you could say the same thing about Dabo Swinney and I don't think there's an ounce of hot seat talk around Dabo Swinney, but the perception of Clemson right now is that they've taken a, a step or two back, which is reality. That's perception, that's reality. I don't think they would argue that. Do they ascend back or do they continue to, you know, sort of slowly drift back? Because they were a top two program in the country. And then, you know, you, you drop off a little bit. You're still a top five program. Then, well, we're still a top 10 program. And I've got them as the 10th best program in the country right now, by the way. We did that the other night on the show. Uh, then you drop off a little bit more. Do you? That's, that's, that's my question. Do you continue to drop off? The other day, actually, last show we did, I was talking about Clemson on the show. And I said, I said, Clemson should be a college football playoff team this year. Those, that's, those were the words I said. And there was a Clemson uh, independent YouTube channel out there that does really good coverage from what I saw. He took it and said, oh, Josh Pate's wrong about that. He's wrong. Uh, Clemson's not going to make the playoff this year. Well, it wasn't a prediction I was making, nor am I making it now. I don't predict the playoff in spring. I barely do it in August. What I said is, when you have uh, those level resources, that level talent roster, and they expand the playoff to 12, unequivocally, you should be a college football playoff team. And if you're not, there should be consequences. So Clemson's got a wide open shot this year. If you look at the FanDuel odds on the ACC, they're right up there. I think they're like a co-favorite to win the ACC. You do that, you'll 100% be in the playoff. If not last year, I guarantee you this year, you will be. But what if, just for argument's sake, Clemson's like nine and three this year. You're not firing Dabo Swinney, but it is indicative of a further subtle slide towards above average and, and a slide further away from being elite. I think Lincoln Riley is a coach at a crossroads this year. Now, ultimately, he has been at one, and I think he knew that. And that's why he made fundamental philosophical shifts to his program. And I credit him for doing it because a lot of guys get to that level, and that's his second major head coaching job, and they look around and just kind of think to themselves, well, I am who I am. Whatever my identity is, whatever my program's identity is, we can tweak it here or there. Well, he's not tweaking it, man. He tore half the house down, and they're rebuilding it. Good for him. I don't know if it's going to work, 
But I'll tell you what he was doing was not going to work. At the highest levels, it was not going to work. And you got to credit a guy for realizing that. So they, they go and they overhaul the defensive staff, which is one of the most upgraded defensive staffs in the country. Contrary to what some people thought I said the other night, I just didn't say it was one of the four most upgraded. And that's its own side argument that I can have with Southern Cal fans amongst ourselves. Uh, but it's a really upgraded defensive staff. Do you have the players overnight to implement and install whatever you want to install? Probably not. But I will tell you this. You need to pay attention to USC recruiting because USC has been kind of making noise all over the country, recruiting areas of the country they're going to have to continue to recruit. So Lincoln Riley, for several reasons, I think, could be viewed as being at a crossroads right now. Not a job security crossroads. Dave Aranda, on the other hand, Baylor, is at a job security crossroads. I've got immense respect for Dave Aranda. I've spoken about it many times on the show, uh, but they have not been good enough. Uh, they were in a situation last year where it looked like he may lose his job, and they kept him, and he went and made some staff moves, and then you know some of the staffers got taken. And so I don't, I don't know how good they're going to be this year. I will say this. Anything's possible in the Big 12. Anything's possible. I would direct your attention to just last year, Neil Brown was at his own crossroads at West Virginia. And Neil Brown was the number one name on a lot of hot seat lists. And then what'd they do? They won way more games than you thought they would because anything's possible in the Big 12, AKA America's College Football Conference. Dave Aranda, I am, I'm actually interested in going to Waco and doing a show from Baylor and having a sit down with Aranda. I have not talked to them about that. Maybe they're watching, but I don't know if enough people have really sat there and listened to him. Dave Aranda's brutally, brutally honest. He's very calculated. He, he's very intentional with everything he says. But he is a guy who, if they're terrible at something, he'll tell you they are, but he'll also walk you through why and what they're trying to do to change it. Um, he's, he's, he's got a mind that goes so far beyond football and actually brings a lot outside of football back into football. And it's just one of the most fascinating guys that you could ever sit there and listen to. And it may be something we explore. But yeah, this year, really big year for Dave Aranda. And I'll tell you another one, just up the road in old Southwest Conference country, Sam Pittman at Arkansas made, made one of the splashiest but also substantive moves in the offseason when he brought in whomst? Bobby Petrino to be his offensive coordinator. And there, there, are, there are most people actually will leave Arkansas for dead this year. So what do you do? That's the definition of a crossroads. Pittman's, Pittman doesn't need the coach, first off. Pittman's 10 times financially set and he'll be good, but he has also, I think, still got a fire to coach there. And I I'm, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to have sit here two years ago and said, oh, man, Pittman, he blends perfectly with Arkansas. What you love is you love that, that culture fit figurehead and then let everything beneath him just sort itself out. I'm not going back on that. It's just that when that's the dynamic, it's not going to work every year. I understand what realistic expectations to be at Arkansas. And then it's fine to have high standards. They should. Uh, they, they just... Went and got Calipari at Kentucky or from Kentucky in basketball, and you, you've got names like Tyson and J.B. Hunt up there and whatnot, and you know, folks in college circles know what that means. Hey, they're not just active in basketball. You know what? For that matter, let, this is just my mind working in real time. Maybe I should have mentioned Arkansas earlier in the transfer portal segment because a program that can go do what they just did in basketball with the names that they have on the donor list in basketball, could also do that in football, could they not? Whomst amongst us knows. Maybe, maybe Arkansas is one of the big surprise splash winners in the portal. This is also the portion of the show where I baselessly speculate and start rumors, and that's not good. That sometimes I get a slap on the wrist from myself uh, for that. But yeah, crossroads year, I think, for Sam Pittman as well. Good show tonight. Nice, solid show. Right at an hour. Uh, we're going to be on the road all week. I told you we're going to be live from Florida Tuesday. We will have Billy Napier on the show. Uh, we're going to go somewhere Wednesday. We're going to go somewhere Thursday, and I will announce those in due time. You know what? I'll give you the Wednesday announcement. We're going to sit down with Malzahn at Central Florida because I've never been to Central Florida. I've been to Orlando. 
I've never been to the University of Central Florida, and Malzahn's awesome. Malzahn, you, you listened to him for a long time. He's been here for a long time. But here's what you have to do with Gus Malzahn. You just got to, boom, you just crack that egg a little bit. And then it's just great stories, and it runs all over the place, and you, you dip your biscuit in it, and it's great. So we're going to have Malzahn on the show. Actually, it won't be on the show. What we'll do is I will go sit down with Gus, and we'll just package that thing up and put it on the YouTube channel Wednesday. And as I've said many times, our goal for doing this is whether you're a Michigan State fan or a fan of the coach's school that we're sitting down with, I want it to appeal to all of you. So I'm not sitting there asking Gus about his right guard situation and how he thinks week three and week four could go for Central Florida. We'll have a little bit of that, but we'll mainly have overarching conversation that sort of uh, hits in every bucket, so to speak. So we've loved doing this. We've gotten great viewership on it, really good traction. Uh, a couple of major clients who have explored putting their name tag on that for next year. And I'm like, where were you guys a month ago? We've been talking about this. But anyway, we appreciate it. Appreciate you guys making it possible. So for, we've got director Colin in there. We've got interim producer Grishy in there. Bradley, the associate is here. We, we are all alone in this building down here in South Florida. So we could do a lot of damage tonight. Management's always close by. You guys have a great start to your week. We appreciate it. God bless.